guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas McGregor. He is a combat veteran and is the author of Margin of Victory, Five Battles That Changed the Face of Modern War. We'll be talking about his career and for much of this hour, uh, the book Margin of Victory. Colonel, thanks very much for your time today. Thank you for inviting me. Well, let's start with your own service to our country. Uh, where were you born and raised and how did you join the service? Well, I was uh, born and raised largely in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, with the exception of uh, one year when I was sent abroad to Germany to study. I spent my 11th grade year in, in Germany. And when I finally managed to graduate from Penn Charter, which was a, a very fine Quaker school in Philadelphia, I ended up going, strangely enough, to the Virginia Military Institute for a year, largely because my performance in math class was appalling, <laughs> and I wasn't terribly interested in math. So I, I spent that year in improving my performance on the SATs. So the following year, I was appointed to the U.S. Military Academy. Graduated from that place in 1976, did the usual things, airborne, ranger, and so forth, went off to Armor Basic, and then spent the balance of my career really in a series of assignments to armored cavalry, armor, and mechanized infantry formations, but I was usually assigned to armored cavalry and tanks. What was it about that that fascinated you? I guess it was the assignment, first of all, so you had to do it, but what challenged you? What, uh, what inspired you in that? I was in the fifth grade, as I recollect, and I was with my mother on one of her shopping sprees somewhere, and as we were in the checkout line, I saw a book called uh, Panzer Battles, written by a German general named von Melanton. And uh, I was already interested because I'd seen the movies uh, with the Germans, and, and I always wanted to know, what are those people saying? <laughs> and I was furious because they, they, in those days, they would have everybody speak English, but then the Germans, who were obviously the enemy, they would say something, I couldn't understand it. So when I saw this, I said, well, this must be interesting, and I picked it up. It was in English, of course. And it was all about uh, the great battles uh, from 1941 until 1945 on the Eastern Front. And I was captured by a fascination with mobility, hmm. fighting fluid uh, operations. And I also noted the very heavy casualties taken in the light infantry, uh, which didn't appeal to me in the least. So I became a, uh, an advocate for mobile armored firepower early in life. And so... About 15 years after your commission, uh, you're in Desert Storm. What was your role there? Well, that, that was a wonderful, uh, strange uh, event for me. Uh, I, at the time, was really quite despondent. In 1990, I had been on active duty, as you say, for 15 years. And I'd served twice on the inter-German and Czechoslovak and German borders in cavalry units, the first time with the 1st of the 1st Cavalry, the 2nd with the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment. And I had been assigned, after a short stint as the regimental adjutant, to be the S3. My career is almost exclusively operations, uh, services and operations officer at every level, all the way up to the very uh, highest strategic levels. And I was the operations officer, and I was sent down there by the regimental commander who brought me in and said, Doug, we've got a big problem in this squadron. It was the 2nd Squadron of the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment. He said uh, they failed at gunnery. They failed their uh, inspector general's inspection. Uh, the, the organization is morale is in the, in the cellar, and I can't relieve the people who are there, who are in charge. So I'm sending you in. I'm replacing the current three. He's leaving. And you're going to have to go down there and try to whip this organization into shape. And that was March of 1990. Wow. And I went down there, and the first thing I started to do, of course, was to talk to everybody, talk to soldiers, sergeants, lieutenants, and captains. It's always been my habit. I find that they're much more truthful than senior officers. <laughs> and I asked several of them, I said, what's wrong? And they said, well, you know, they never gave us any training. I, I, I said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, before we went to Gunner, we really, Gunnery, we really did not train. We had all these other distractions, and since we did not systematically train, well, of course, when we got to gunnery, we didn't perform very well. So I got that from the scouts who were on the Bradley fighting vehicles. I got that from the tankers. I got it from the artillerymen. Everybody said the same thing over and over and over again. So I, I then began dealing with the, the leadership at the time, which was difficult uh, because the commander was... He was actually not the man who had been picked to command the unit. Uh, the man who was picked for one reason or another was removed from the command list. He was a secondary selection. And I think he was very insecure and very unhappy about that. But he was happy to be in command. I just don't think he was ready for it. Uh, 
we had a difficult time, but we developed a relationship uh, that allowed him to finally trust me. And over time, uh, that trust evolved into a relationship that allowed me to do what I thought was really important. So by July and August, when we went back, uh, about the time that Saddam Hussein moved into Kuwait, uh, the performance was brilliant. Uh, and of course, the regimental commander came down and had a long talk with me, and I told him what had happened. He was very pleased. We just eliminated the distractions. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of these classes and activities that seem so important in peacetime, but don't have any meaning whatsoever when you go into action. And I was very focused on the readiness to fight. So then Saddam Hussein did us a favor of uh, in invading Kuwait and rescued me from what I thought would be boring tour in Germany. As the last thing I wanted to do is go back and repeat the same old process of maneuver training and gunnery training and everything else. And eventually we were, we were deployed over there. And of course that was for me and, and for anybody who understands uh, both history and the region, a paradise because you're, you're talking about a flat open desert. It was the Indianapolis 500 for armor. So we were suddenly able to spread out and do things that we had never been able to do before in garrison in Germany. And the thing that I struggled with at the time was how impressed I was with the very high quality of the individual soldier uh, who was technically very competent, who could master the computers that we had, who mastered the technical requirements of the complex weapon systems like the chain guns, the tow missiles and so forth. Uh, who could make decisions quickly if he was confident that you would back him up. Very impressed with the, with the officers, the junior officers. And, and what I also was impressed with was the absence of fear. Because it didn't take them very long to look around in Saudi Arabia and conclude, you know, uh, these people here aren't very impressive. They seem uh, to be polite, uh, somewhat confused about themselves. And I told the soldiers, I said, you, you're absolutely right. There is no difference between the Arab here and the Arab on the other side of the border. And so we, we developed very early on a much more measured and I think accurate picture of the potential adversary. And at the same time, from the top down, we were getting deluged with all of these ridiculous reports about new divisions and new formations arriving and new weapon systems that made... Uh, Saddam Hussein sounded like Stalin and the uh, Iraqi army in front of us like the Waffen SS was just nonsense. Ultimately, we had the best of all opportunities because we, we had this gradual introduction over several days of interaction with the enemy. And that's very good because we were all green troops. I had one man who was with me, my op sergeant major had been to Vietnam. He was superb and did a brilliant job. His name was Ketchings, tall, handsome, distinguished looking uh, black man who just radiated confidence and he kept all the young soldiers that, that we had in, in very good spirits. Kept telling him, look, I've been here before, not every bullet's made for you, uh, and so forth and so on. And we taught the soldiers, I think collectively, he who shoots first wins. And we were the lead unit into Iraq. So we saw the Iraqi enemy over three days before we finally fought the so-called Republican Guard. And that gave the soldiers an opportunity to develop self-confidence. So they went from being green troops to being very confident combat troops. And when they hit the Republican Guard, they struck the Republican Guard like a thunderbolt. And the Republican Guards fought much more effectively than any of their predecessors. They didn't lack for, for guts, but they weren't very well organized. And they didn't present a coherent defense. And so we smashed them up uh, very, very quickly. And we attacked moving, which nobody else in the theater did. In other words, we didn't stop when we saw the enemy. We went right for the jugular, which is what we trained to do. And that uh, was a profound experience for me. I came away with the view that this organization, technology, human capital mix, getting the right mix of high quality people with the right technology inside the right organizational construct was the real answer to victory on the battlefield. So I took that into command in my unit when I was commanding the 1st of the 4th Cavalry at Fort Riley, Kansas in November 93, turned in the best performance of any unit in the history of the National Training Center. We won uh, all, all but one of the battles. We had a tie for one uh, and then utterly annihilated the op for, which of course is not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go and lose and learn. But I told the soldiers, I said, I'm not interested in losing and learning. I want to go there and win and teach.
and that's what we did. It, it, it got mixed reviews at high levels because people didn't like the idea of a, a unit showing up that beat the living daylights out of the op for, frankly. But again, that had a big impact on me, and I was also able to integrate ground and air at that point because we had a substantial aviation component. From there on out, uh, uh, that's when I wrote my, my second book. Uh, the first was, of course, my doctoral dissertation, but the second one was called Breaking the Phalanx. And that's when I began looking at how would you reorganize the ground force to integrate with aerospace power, for, you know, your, your striking power. And then I went on to uh, become the director of joint operations at SHAPE headquarters during the Kosovo Air Campaign, and that was an even better learning experience because now I saw the rest of the force from the inside and the capabilities and convinced me more than ever that if you can integrate these effectively within the right construct, you are unbeatable. So those are the, really the principal experiences from my military career that uh, profoundly influenced me and ultimately had a, have a great deal to do with the book I've written. Well, it's a perfect uh, prelude to the book, which we'll get to just after the break. We're talking with uh, retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas McGregor. The book is Margin of Victory, Five Battles That Changed the Face of Modern War. And we'll tell you right off the bat, four of them don't involve the United States. And we'll explain uh, what those battles are and why they matter so much to the evolution of the modern fighting military. I'm Greg Columbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. Honored to be joined in studio today by retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas MacArthur, also author, Douglas McGregor, also the author of the book Margin of Victory. I'm sure you don't mind the promotion, but... Uh, <laughs> Actually, he's a distant cousin. Is he? Yes. Amazing. We're descended from the same bunch in the Highlands. <laughs> so, Margin of Victory, uh, we're going to look at battles from World War I, uh, a pair from World War II, the Israelis at the Suez in 1973, and finally uh, Desert Storm. Why did you decide to write this book? One of the critical lessons that I took from 1991 was the enormous amount of time invested in the preparation of the armed forces between 1975 and 1990. Across the board, in all of the armed forces, but especially in the United States Army. Some of your viewers will remember that things were not good in the aftermath of Vietnam. And we were fortunate to have some general officers who had actually served in the Second World War. And they set out to build a new army that could take on, at the time, the Soviet armed forces because they were presumed to be the most likely enemy. And their modernization went hand in hand with the organizational construct and enormous effort in training and bringing in better quality soldiers, sergeants, lieutenants, and captains, and giving them the right training and experience to make them effective. And that taught me something. And I then decided when I wrote this book, I'm going to go back and look at what has happened in the last hundred years. Not because I think the previous uh, several thousand are not important, but the 20th century is close to us. And most of what we're dealing with right now is fallout from that century. Absolutely. And what you find is a similar story in each case. Decisions made 10, 15, sometimes 20 years in advance that influence how you fight, how you organize, how you think about warfare, the technologies that are chosen for integration into the force, and then finally the quality. Now, I'm talking about soldiers, sergeants, lieutenants, and captains of individual soldiers, as well as that construct for command how you integrate at a high level, particularly in, in this case, I'm talking about the operational level, just below the strategic, and then the strategic decisions that lead to the, to the war. National culture plays a major role in all of this. Each nation treats its military differently and treats the challenges of preparing for war differently. You mentioned, uh, and just in passing there, about the decisions that are often made a decade or two or even more uh, prior to a battle or a war that often make a huge difference. Talk about why that seems to be a, a concept most of us don't think of. We often think of decisions made in the heat of battle being, being so critical and, and why it's important to understand that. Well, Americans, and I would say that the British are, are very much like us. Probably we both speak English. We're both insular powers, similar culture, similar governmental structures. Shortly after the Boer War, which was not a, a resounding success story for the British Army, but was nevertheless declared a victory for the British, and they did win. Uh, there was a conclusion reached by a new liberal government in 1905 that it was time for the army to be reformed and reorganized, that we could not go forward in Great Britain and fight as we had in the past. 
So they end up with a, an attorney, a lawyer, with no military experience, but a remarkable background in philosophy who's also a Germanophile, speaks, reads, and writes German, studied there. He steps in and with great skill and efficiency, takes this British army, which is designed to suppress tribesmen, insurgents, rebels, chase them through the deserts and hills and mountains, and forges it into a modern army that is designed to fight potentially the Russians, Germans, French, Chinese. They're not really sure, quite frankly, in 1905. That army becomes the British Expeditionary Force that is the subject of the first chapter. And he builds Britain's first general staff. And he tries for the first time to integrate what the Royal Navy does with what the Army does in a way that makes sense. So that's one of the examples. And then it was a very successful outcome uh, for Britain once it entered the war, because had that not happened, the British, frankly, would have had virtually nothing to send. Instead, they had this rapidly deploying force that was devastating. I think we are in a very similar position right now. Uh, as the British. We, we are coming out of a, of a long period where we've been chasing insurgents and rebels, and the forces which formerly could fight a capable enemy just don't exist. They're not trained. They're not available. We're at a point where we need to go through a similar process. And when you look at the other states that are, that are mentioned here, the Japanese, for instance, they discovered uh, during the Russo-Japanese War that they could take on and defeat uh, a Russian opponent but they tended to learn lots of the long, wrong lessons. They tended to think that they could sacrifice thousands of people. And that was all right because their people were braver than the enemy. And so there was a failure to look at the industrial base and the criticality of modernization uh, long term. Uh, that comes back to haunt them when they end up in the Second World War fighting the United States and the Soviet Union. They are simply not in a position technologically to compete. On the other hand, the Soviets, after World War I, uh, are now governed by Bolsheviks, uh, committed Marxists, who tend to view the world almost exclusively through technological lies, and they set out to build a, a force that can conquer the world. They are at war with the world from the moment they take over in Moscow. Stalin picks this up, and he creates the world's first war mobilization state. So when the war begins, he has enormous reserves of uh, material, enormous numbers of, of people. But the force takes time to be effective, and it depends also very heavily on mistakes made by the Germans. Germans never do that because the original German army never thought in terms of war with the world. So I, you, you see different kinds of decisions made for national cultural reasons that at the time made sense. But sometimes those reasons punish you later and you lose. Colonel, let's pause right there. We'll be right back. More with retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas McGregor. The book is Margin of Victory. We'll be right back. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. We are joined in studio today by retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas McGregor. He is a combat veteran, both of Desert Storm as well as the uh, war in Kosovo, and he's also the author of Margin of Victory, Five Battles That Changed the Face of Modern War. And, Colonel, you set the stage in our previous segment about why you wrote the book and some of the lessons that are important to learn that uh, often get ignored or misunderstood by history. Let's just start at the top of the list. Uh, it's the Battle of Mons. It's very early on. It's August of 1914, the Guns of August, uh, uh, that, that begin World War I after the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, and then all these countries jump in on, on different sides. Germany very nearly uh, wipes out uh, the Western Front um, in the first few weeks of this campaign. And you focus on the British Expeditionary Force, as you point out in the, in the previous segment. The title of the chapter is Mission Impossible. The British get hammered uh, here at, at Mons, but the ability to retreat effectively is, is the takeaway uh, here. And it's from concepts, as you mentioned, were developed decades before. How was the British Expeditionary Force able to live to fight another day? Well, I think there are three things. First of all, as you point out, this was the creature of Sir Richard Haldane, uh, who, who builds this thing almost from scratch, uh, starting in 1905. And then the, the force is assembled in, in England, largely, for training. Uh, he improves the educational standards and, and actually tries to set up educational programs in the British Army for soldiers, recognizing how important that is. Then he outfits them with new equipment, uh, especially rifles, rifles. 
and machine guns, and they learn how to use these generally very effectively. So they're ready when, when the battle begins. And what they are there to do is to prevent the French from being outflanked. That was really their mission. And they manage that not so much because of their size, but because of the inability of the German armies to envelop and destroy them. The German commander of the First Army almost becomes obsessed with this small British force that's in front of him. Not only do they inflict heavy casualties on his, his uh, advancing force, but he can't catch them and destroy them. So he, he, instead of moving further north and further west, which would have been the smart thing to do, essentially just move around them, mm -hmm. he follows them and uh, fights several battles against them, uh, taking losses along the way, which, quite frankly, he, he didn't need to take. The British take terrible losses, 15,000 in 10 days to two weeks, but the army holds together, which is remarkable. The strain is unbelievable because this is a new kind of war for which no one was prepared. And they manage to retreat to the Marne. They hold their position. And thanks to their performance, the French are able to move more troops to the center of the Marne, where the real battle is decided against the Germans. And the Germans end up seeing 30,000 British troops one more time on the Marne show up between two armies, the second and the first, which tends to unhinge the German high command and the rest is history. The, the Schlieffen plan, which was uh, the German push through Belgium to get to, to Paris, I, I often think of it as almost a, an offensive lineman using his uh, ability to push the, the rushing defender out of the, the way of the quarterback, and, and Paris was saved. If the British Expeditionary Force does not execute the retreat with the excellence that it did, does Paris survive? No. I think that the British Expeditionary Force, if it had simply done what a lot of people wanted it to do, at the time, which was stand its ground, dig in and fight, would have been annihilated. The Germans would simply have rolled over it like a steamroller. And that loss would have opened the flank uh, in a way that would la have allowed the Germans to march directly into Paris. So I think anyone who suggests that perhaps the British, this small force of at the most 180,000 when it finally was assembled, did not make a difference is wrong. I think it had a profound impact on the outcome of that opening campaign, which, as we know, leads to the stalemate. And when you talk about the stalemate, uh, World War I, perhaps the least imaginative tactics overall in certainly modern military history, how much does what the British Expeditionary Force was able to accomplish stand out compared to the lack of imagination the rest of the way? Well, there was no room, to be blunt, uh, for much imagination once the stalemate begins. In fact, uh, Lord Kitchener, who was the Minister of War, said, this is the war of spade and wire. I don't know anything about this. Uh, in fact, everybody on both sides was really prepared for a war of movement. Uh, the British had, uh, for the most part, light artillery, which was very mobile, which they thought would be terribly useful. As it turns out, large, heavy guns that pound people into the dust turn out to be decisive. But again, uh, at the outset, there was no appreciation for what would happen, despite the fact that they'd seen the Russo-Japanese War. And there should have been an understanding that firepower had reached a point that w would not permit the kind of maneuver that people wanted to engage in. And so as a result, you really see most of the uh, focus after this initial campaign switch to the east, frankly, for the Germans, because there is the opportunity for open movement that doesn't exist in the west. Was there a lot of copycatting once people understood what the British accomplished there? No, I think what happened was that this was the end of a form of warfare uh, that involved highly trained, regular professional troops. And what we saw then was a new kind of warfare that was really attrition, an exercise in firepower and mass, masses of citizens that sat across from each other in trenches until one side or the other collapsed. In fact, there's a term used for it called competitive collapse. And the challenge was to see who could hold out the longest, take the losses, and survive. And ultimately, had we not entered the war in 1917 and then showed up in great strength in 1918, the Austrians and the Germans would have prevailed in the West, there's no doubt. Our arrival was very timely, and we took terrible casualties in order to convince the Germans and the Austrians that it was hopeless. 318,000 American casualties in just 110 days. Incredible, incredible figures, and all sides in that war, of course, lost huge numbers. Um, let's move on to World War II, um, barely 20 years after uh, the Battle of Mons. And Chapter 2 of your book talks about the battle for uh, Shanghai. You tell the story of how uh, Japanese leaders and General Matsui were, were transforming the military over a pattern of about 10 years. They brought him back out of retirement to, 
to, to spearhead this effort to take Shanghai. This seems more like a bloodbath and, and a slugfest. So what, it, what is the uh, transformational tactic here that, that makes this one of the most important battles? Well, century? the Japanese send all of their officers all over the world to the United States, Great Britain, France, Russia, in an effort to try and, and chart a course into the future. They came back with the, the following conclusion. We should have a navy like the British and an army like the Germans. Uh, General Lugaki, who eventually becomes Minister of War, does everything he can to build a German-like army in Japan. But he loses the battle because the old guard generals want hundreds of thousands of men with rifles and bayonets. They are convinced that that is the key to victory. And he argues, no, it isn't. We need mobile armored firepower, aircraft, better artillery, mobile artillery, and, and so forth and so on. He has some modest, modest success, which shows up at Shanghai, because in the absence of those new capabilities, tanks and aviation and the cooperation between aviation and ground forces and mobile artillery, you get the World War I stalemate. And so Shanghai begins with the Japanese largely organized for World War I against a Chinese enemy who's just exhausted from years of civil war. And of course, it's a war that really didn't need to be fought because Relations between China and Japan at that point were actually very good. Uh, and it was a, a decision taken in a heat of passion in Tokyo by the, the then minister of, of war who persuaded the emperor to do this. Disaster ensues. Obviously, the Japanese can overpower the Chinese, but they take heavy casualties until finally they begin to concentrate what few tanks they have, use them in coordination with aviation, and they begin to make progress and break through the Chinese. And then, of course, you get to uh, Nanking and the, the tragedy that ensues there because the killing is so ferocious that it becomes a, a kind of latter-day culture war, race war between the Chinese and the Japanese that should never have happened but did. And the great tragedy is that Matsui that you mentioned, who was the commander, is actually a friend of Sun Yat-sen and uh, had actually been an advocate for liberation of China from colonial influence from the West. And I think most of the Japanese thought that's what they were doing initially. They were liberating not just China, but the rest of Asia from Western colonial influence. But it didn't work out that way. Uh, and the Japanese, sadly, don't learn a great deal from this. They never learn the criticality of reducing the size of your force to extract savings so that you can invest it prudently in new capabilities. And that's the real lesson. The Japanese, of course, today have learned that. But the other point that, that, needs, that Americans need to take away from this chapter, and one of the reasons I wrote it, is to understand how terrible that experience was and this legacy of war with Japan that haunts China in the present because this war lasts for years because it results in this occupation, which the Japanese could not end because the Chinese wouldn't put an end to the war. This drains them just as the occupation, so to say, in Russia drains the Germans, as occupations always drain armies. There's no end to this war. And uh, the Japanese uh, threat is still very real in Chinese minds, and they tend to associate us today with that. And they associate us with the Royal Navy and the colonial experience with the British. So if you read this, you've got to gain an appreciation for the things that run through Chinese minds that explain their behavior that is not really inherently hostile to us at all. You mentioned uh, Germany, and let's move to the Eastern Front in the European theater now for Chapter 3, and that's the destruction of Germany's army center, 1944. Here in the West, of course, we focused on D-Day and Patton's march across France and that sort of thing. Um, but over in, in the East, uh, the Germans are bogged down at this point because in 1941 they tried to do a quick win uh, on the Eastern Front. They didn't get it, and that sets up the, the point I think you're making here, where Stalin played the long game and Hitler played the short game and Stalin wins. That's right. And Hitler was never prepared for the long game. He always had a short game army. And Stalin, on the other hand, did what the czars have done historically, which is retreat into the interior and leaving Hitler with a, an 1,100-mile front that he could not possibly defend effectively, uh, surrendering the initiative to the Soviets. The destruction of Army Group Center, however, is very important because its lessons reverberate right up into the present. This is the battle where the Soviets, after years of practice against the Germans, are able to very expertly integrate what today we call strike, the striking power of air power, artillery, 
rockets, missiles with an attacking ground force that is heavily armored and has mobile armored infantry in it. This synchronization of the two is brought to a high art in the destruction of Army Group Center. At the same time, the Germans are now exhausted. In fact, Hitler is so insistent that the attack will not come where it does that most of the troops are sent on leave. Now, I really studied the German journals, because I, the, 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 the papers, because I was convinced that the German generals decided Hitler was crazy. The Soviets were coming because it was not a surprise. They did know they were coming there, but Hitler refused to believe it. And I think they may have sent a lot of these soldiers on leave to save their lives, to be blunt. And so all of the prudent measures that are recommended to Hitler about adjusting the lines, falling back to rivers, changing the plan of battle and so forth, everything is rejected. And the Soviets are handed a, on a silver plate an opportunity unlike any they've ever had. They get everything right. The Germans get everything wrong. And this largely unmotorized infantry force with a few anti-tank guns and some artillery is just smashed to pieces by this very modern force that is highly integrated. And to give you a quick example, General Eisenhower had to negotiate for almost nine months with the Air Forces to get them to bomb what he thought was important for the success of D-Day. During uh, the attack on Army Group Center, Marshal Zhukov simply gave an order that he wanted 5,000 fighter bombers to attack 50,000 encircled Germans. It happened in 15 minutes. That was the level of integration and unity of command that the Soviets achieved that nobody up until that point, and I would argue no one since, has matched. And that unity of command was vital to victory. Was it easier on the Eastern Front because they were the only Allied power and they didn't have to work with other powers in a supreme... They had large numbers of non-Russians in their force, but they treated them as components of their army. They did not brook any disputes from allies. In other words, shut up, get in line, we're in charge. That's the way the Russians run things. That's the way the Soviets run things. That's the only way to run it if you're going to win. We didn't do that. That's true. But we had another problem, and that is the service problem. I'm the Air Force. This is my war. This is my way of doing things. We can win this on our own. Impossible in the Soviet military structure. Everyone is focused like a laser on the goal, and everyone pulls his oar on the ship that is sailing towards that goal. So no air marshal would have said, stop. If you'll let me pick the targets deeper, I'll win the battle. If he'd done that, he'd have been shot. About 60 seconds before our next break, the toll on the Russian population from World War II was immense. Uh, the numbers vary, but it's anywhere from 25 to 30 million probably if when you factor in... Security. Actually, it's much larger. Is it? Oh, yes. And when I was in Moscow in uh, November 2001... I was there with a group opening uh, discussions with the Russian General Staff and Russian General Staff Academy. And the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Russian General Staff uh, had dinner with me. It turns out he was fluent in German. I was fluent in German, so we had a great evening together. And he told me that the NKVD archives, which were still open at that point, they'd been opened in the late 90s for inspection by historians, had revealed 39,900,000 wow. dead. And he said they were still counting. There are even higher figures now, this uh, caused such an uproar in the Soviet Union, or excuse me, Russia today, that Mr. Putin passed a law that there could be no public criticism of the conduct of the war, and he closed the NKVD archives, period, not allowing anybody to go in there and see what was in there. So the truth is actually far, far worse than we ever appreciated. And if you begin to look at the demographic studies that were done after the war by a man named Murray Fishbach, a uh, very, very brilliant uh, demographer, he really demonstrated that this was true. Whole segments of society vanished. There was a break in generations. It, that's how terrible the losses were. And of course, the only way they could do this was with the NKVD, with the uh, divisions of secret police forces, paramilitary forces forcing people into action. A huge toll uh, to make this strategy effective. Uh, Colonel, let's pause right there. When we come back, we'll talk about the last two chapters in this book and the battle lessons from them. We'll be right back. We are back with the final segment on this week's edition of Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus. Thanks for being with us. Honored to be joined in studio today by retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas McGregor. The book is Margin of Victory, Five Battles That Changed the Face of Modern War, and is often the case on the program, Colonel. Uh, time is <laughs> getting away from us. Uh, fascinating discussion, and we have two chapters left. So, 
chapter four uh, is about a war that I think most Americans are aware of, but not necessarily in, in the details, and that would be the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Uh, Israel, of course, uh, six years earlier had, in six days, uh, wiped out uh, the threat from its neighbors, but uh, then the surprise attack in 1973. What's the takeaway from, from that? The takeaway is that the Israelis have a national general staff. They have a high command that could operate on two fronts simultaneously and defeat both of their opponents effectively by allocating resources, ground forces, air forces, naval forces as necessary, making decisions about when and where they would concentrate. And the other point is the high quality of the individual Israeli soldier, highly intelligent, very thoughtful, well-educated, technically competent, ready to take risks, ready to make decisions on the site that were critical to the outcome of battles. On the Egyptian side, the Egyptians had a much tougher time because only 32% of the population was literate. And so to address this problem, Sadat, uh, Mr. Sadat harnessed all of the nation's university students to the military, bringing them in to critical positions. And the Egyptian army, as a result, fought infinitely better than it ever had and surprised the Israelis. And they worked within the limitations of their potential. And they managed to seize control of a portion of that canal and hold on to it because the goal was not to destroy Israel. The goal was to regain the Sinai and Egypt, Egypt's national honor. They managed to do that. They were still on the losing end at the end of the war in a strategic sense. But on the other hand, strategically, they achieved their goal. And I think that's what uh, we should look for in future wars, which is look for solutions that end conflicts that both sides can live with. Very important. And then we talked about it earlier, and that's Desert Storm. That's chapter yeah. five, and uh, basically a, a kind of a brand new approach uh, for the U.S. military in a way that, as we mentioned earlier, coming out of Vietnam, there was a lot of hesitation about what we could accomplish, and the U.S. military exceeded all expectations. What, what was the, the thing that made that so successful? Decisions made in the late 60s, early 70s about equipment, about technology, organization, and human capital in all of the services pay off handsomely. You have a Navy, which is a brand new Navy, that is built uh, largely from scratch, thanks to Admiral Zumwalt and a lot of the decisions he made. The, the Air Force goes through a similar process. You, you suddenly have superior technology, superior equipment, and first-class human capital soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marine operating them. All of those things stem from decisions in the late 70s, mid-70s. And you arrive in 1990 doing something that you really hadn't seen since 1914 with the British Expeditionary Force. You've moved hundreds of thousands of troops and equipment along with ships and aircraft all the way around the world, thousands of miles, in something that no one else in history has ever done. And you assemble them in the desert, and then you hurl them at the enemy. The problem is that in contrast to the Israelis, there is no national general staff, no national high command, there is no unity of effort, and there is no coherent planning thought through in terms of purpose, method, and end state. What are we doing? How are we going to do it? And what do we want this to look like when we're through? None of those things have been thought through. And to a large extent, I have to blame that on the senior generals, the army generals, who were still very traumatized from the Vietnam period. They were surprised by the performance of the units that they commanded, shocked that it had gone so well. And this after 40 days of unnecessary air campaign, to be blunt. Uh, we did not do what the Russians did in uh, the destruction of Army Group Center. We did not organize ourselves to integrate the capabilities. Had we done that, that war would have been over in a few days. Instead, it dragged on and on. And by the time we finally attack, of course, the enemy is weak. But as I point out in the chapter, for reasons of national culture, that enemy was never able to present the resistance to us that we imputed to them. And so the lesson of that is, again, national culture is very important. Understand yourself as well as your enemy. Know your own limitations as well as the enemy's limitations. And then look for ways to maximize the effectiveness of your force by integrating it and achieving that synergy, which the Soviets did, the Germans did it from time to time, the Japanese managed a little of it, the British did not in, in 1914. But we can do that in ways today, and that's the importance of ISR, strike, maneuver, and sustainment, those capabilities, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, integrated with 
the striking power of your aerospace and naval forces as well as your ground maneuver force. The hour has gotten away from us. Colonel, a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for your service to our country. Congratulations on the book and thanks for your time with us today. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas McGregor, combat veteran of both the Gulf War as well as the war in Kosovo. He's also the author of Margin of Victory, Five Battles That Changed the Face of Modern War. I'm Greg Columbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, where are at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.